episode so that we have a this for posterity. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Messias. I'm with the National Council for History Education. I'm the educational coordinator. I'm going to turn it over to Joanne, and then we'll talk a little bit about rules. So, Joanne. Hello, folks. Uh, here I am. Uh, thank you guys all for joining me. I'm playing with my computer here. There we go. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm very excited that you have come this morning to, of course, I need to say the title, History Matters and so does coffee. It really matters. Um, and as I've said a couple of times on social media and as the National Council for History Education has said, I'm going to be every Thursday morning at 10 o'clock talking about some document or artifact or idea or community or something that I find really interesting, exciting, and revealing. And the revealing part is the important part. I'm going to come back to that when I plunge in here. But before I plunge in, I want to toss things back to Matt because he's going to offer a few ground rules for asking questions and things like that. And then we will get started. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think we're all getting in this little world that we're living in now. We're all getting very familiar with Zoom and um, other kinds of video chats but uh, or webinars. Um, as I mentioned in the tweet, we, this is going to be a webinar format. So um, the best way for you to ask questions of Joanne uh, is to use the Q&A feature. Um, I'll have both Q&A and chat open. I'll be kind of monitoring them, but I'll be asking the questions from the Q&A. So if you um, have a question at any time, put it in Q&A. Um, and then we have a Q&A session at the end after uh, Joanne has some time to talk. So um, I'm going to uh, kind of quiet down and let her do her thing. And and um, just thank you all for coming and for working through this with us. And hopefully this will be something that we can uh, really build on. This is our first first opportunity. This, so we're really excited to to try it out. So, so I am going to... Uh, make Joanne the spotlight video and I am going to go away. So <laughs> Joanne, it's all you. Thank you everybody. And again, use the Q&A feature and we will get to your questions later. In okay. Um, okay. So uh, just a few words before we get to the document. There is a document. Um, but I wanted to at least offer a brief explanation as to why <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing this. Um, and part of the reason is obvious, which is that we're all sheltered in place. And I figured as long as we're all sheltered in place, I can contribute something out there for us and even better. It'll be a history something that I throw out there, right? I'll get a chance to teach some history and talk about some history. Uh, and in and of itself, that's a fine and wonderful thing, as you know, the National Council for History Education would certainly tell you that. I would say it too, right? Just the fact that we're here and we're going to be thinking about and talking about history all by itself is great. The extra bonus to this, and this certainly was on my mind when I thought about it, is what, what I'm really going to be doing, and I think what you're going to be doing, is asking questions about the past, asking questions about the documents and artifacts that we're looking at, and in learning to ask smart questions about the past, we're gonna learn how to ask smart questions about the present. So I think learning how to gain insights from the past will inform us as to how we got here and how we can think about or, or ask questions of our current moment to better inform ourselves or to get better insights. This is a complicated moment. I think the more tools we have in our toolbox to think about it, the better. Okay, now with my official introduction done, um, I want to get to the document. Reaching for my document here. Um, surprise, surprise, it's a Hamilton document. <laughs> and I know you're not surprised, but interestingly, as you'll see, what's most interesting about this and the reason I've chosen it has less to do with the fact that it's from Hamilton and more to do with what he says. Now, I want to offer you just a little bit of background before the document itself. Um, it's written by Hamilton in late September of 1787. So at, at this point, Hamilton had been a, an early and very eager and aggressive advocate for a stronger central government. He didn't think the Articles 
of Confederation. We're a strong enough government. So he's out there writing and churning and talking and trying to push people along with a lot of other people with him, pushing people towards what ultimately becomes the Constitutional Convention, the Federal Convention. So that comes in 1787. Hamilton is a delegate there. Unfortunately for poor Hamilton, he's there with two other New York delegates who are not very excited about strengthening the national government, so he's outvoted. Doesn't mean he doesn't have a lot to say at the convention, but at any rate, he's outvoted. I always feel he must have been a very frustrated guy. Okay, so that's the backstory. The convention ends, and within a week or two, Hamilton sits down to write this document. Now, about the document, he wrote on the top of it, and it, I'll come back to what this does and doesn't tell us. He wrote on the top of it, conjectures about the new constitution. And at this point, the constitution has been passed by the federal convention. Now it has to go out to be ratified. This is actually before he's written, begun the Federalist essays, just after the convention. Conjectures about the new constitution. And what the document is, maybe it's a draft of an essay, Maybe it's a kind of memorandum. It could be either one, as you'll hear. It's really lawyerly in the way that he wrote it, which means it could be either one. But it, he very much is evaluating what he thinks will happen next. So in this very lawyerly way, he says, um, okay, so the new constitution, it has some things in its favor. And he lists those things. He says, well, you know, there are a lot of men of great reputation who are in favor of it. That's, that's very helpful. Commercial interests will like it. Excellent. Uh, men of property will like it because they're going to want things to be stable, and this seems to promise that. Excellent. People who are creditors um, of the U.S. are going to think, you know, well, maybe we'll actually get paid back if there's this government. That's a happy thing. Um, and then he says some people actually understand that this is a need and they'll be desirous of this change. So that's all in the pro column. So that's in its favor. What's against the Constitution at this moment, right after it's been passed by the convention? It says, well, there are some important men who don't like it. There are a lot of men, he says, many inconsiderable men <laughs> who still have enough power that their words matter and they're not gonna like to be um, outshone on the national stage. They wanna be important men locally. A new national government is gonna put them not in the limelight, it's gonna reduce their power. They're not gonna like this very much. Um, he then says, you know, no, no one likes taxes. Maybe people who are not very excited about taxes are not gonna like the idea of a stronger national government. Um, he says some people are gonna be jealous of the idea of stronger power. They're not gonna like institutions that seem, as he puts it, calculated to place power in a few hands. And some foreign nations are not gonna be really excited about a more, as he puts it, energetic government in the United States. So that's the pros, that's the cons. And now he goes on next, okay. So that's, that's yes or no, and he's not sure. He actually is very clear about saying, I don't know what's going to happen. It could go either way. So, loyally point number three. What happens if it doesn't get ratified? What happens if, um, as he puts it, the Constitution does not obtain? He says, okay, well, maybe civil war. It's pretty blunt. You know, I mean, the, the states will probably turn against each other. They'll battle each other. Maybe there'll be separate little confederacies and they'll fight each other. Uh, he goes on to say, you know, maybe some states will want to go back to link up with Great Britain. It's possible. He says, you know, not everybody <laughs> hates Great Britain. So maybe they'll go back. So he, he kind of paints this apocalyptic image of civil war, disunion, going back to Great Britain, right? If, if the Constitution isn't ratified, this might happen. And then he goes on and says, no, if it, if it is, if the government is adopted, probably General Washington will be president. That would be good. Washington's choice of men will be good, I'm sure. And people will trust those men because they trust Washington. Excellent. He says that's, that's a good sign too. So that maybe people will trust and um, th this new government and be willing to give it some power. So he paints this apocalyptic picture. He says, you know, but maybe it's okay, Washington, People will be willing to give the government trust and power. 
And here's the kicker at the end of this document. He says, well, you know, if that should not be the case, if Washington doesn't become president, if people don't give trust or power to this new government, I actually then think that the union's gonna dissolve on that first apocalyptic picture I'm describing, civil war rejoining with Britain. As he put it, quote, that seems to be the most likely result. So he's like, think about what he's just said, right? He's 10 days out of the Constitutional Convention, sits down and says, what do I think is going to happen next? Pros and cons, pros and cons, paints this horrible picture, says there are, th there are reasons to think it actually may pass. If it doesn't, disunion, civil war, horrible things are going to happen, and then, quote, that seems to be the most likely result, right? That, that's, that's an interesting statement, right? For someone who's been pushing for this for so long, he's actually kind of thinking it's just not going to work. Now, to me, that's, that's just a fascinating document for a lot of reasons. Um, on a topic that I actually don't want to go into this morning, the fact of the matter is he never, Hamilton never fully trusted the government that came out of the Constitutional Convention and always tried to push it into being something else. So that's kind of the first glimmer of that. But more important than that, I picked this document, well, I picked it for a lot of reasons. One of them is I just find it fascinating because you just don't expect this delegate from the Constitutional Convention to leave it and say, meh, <laughs> I don't think it's gonna work. But what's really interesting about it to me is number one, what does it tell us about the way we view the founding? Now that's something I teach a lot uh, at Yale and everywhere else, I lecture on it. And it, it makes sense, I mean, just think about it, we call it the founding, you know, as though it's in all capital letters, the founding. Um, we see it as, this you know block of marble thing that happened we don't think about the fact that there were no of courses at that moment you know we think well of course there was a declaration of independence of course we won the revolution of course there was a constitution of course it was ratified there are a lot of of courses that we don't even think about or realize are of courses that are stuck right in front of us when we think about the founding. One of the things I love about this document is that it basically is saying, no, no. Like, we can't assume those of courses because people at the time didn't have them, right? If you wanna understand in some way how people at a moment in the past understood their options or their choices, you have to try to look through their eyes, right? We look back, from the present at the past, we, we know what comes next. And so it's easy for us to say, those silly people, they tried the Articles of Confederation, couldn't possibly work. Why did it take them so long to come up with the Constitution? Yeah, we can say that a couple hundred years later, but the fact of the matter is people at the time were figuring this out one step at a time. Contingency, right? that's the most important thing, or certainly one of the most important things to understand when you're looking at history. We, you need to, in addition to looking back from the present, you need to look forward with the people you're studying. What did they think were their options? How were they viewing their world? What did they think was likely to happen? Because all of those questions are gonna shape what they do. And to begin to understand what they're doing, you have to think in that kind of a way. So asking those kinds of questions, thinking about contingency. I'm going to come back to that again and again. You can see why in this first episode, uh, contingency is the topic I've come up with because I think it's a good starting point, right? It needs to be right here when you're thinking about studying history. So all of that, uh, historically speaking, is why I chose the document. And it'll also give us new insights into the founding, and that's a fine thing too. However, there's an additional reason why I've chosen this document that has less to do with the past and more to do with the present. Now, I think we're in a moment where it's tempting, you know, the current moment that we're in as complicated and con confusing and challenging and fraught and frightening as it may be, it's tempting to do Two things, I think, and some I think we've all seen lots of people, uh, people we know and people on the airwaves saying either, 
well, that's it. We're all going to hell in a handbasket. That was a nice country while it lasted. We're done. There are other people who are saying, eh, it's all going to be okay in the end, right? We've always been okay before. It's all going to be okay in the end. Part of what I'm saying this morning and talking about that document is we are in a moment of extreme contingency and we can't make either assumption. We don't know if it's over. We don't know that it's going to go well. We don't know. And so I just think in thinking about the present, it's so important, particularly given how fraught it is and even how frightening it can be, it's so important to think about the fact that this is a moment of contingency. Things are being worked out, but they're not decided yet. And the important part of that is we need to take action to push things towards wherever we want them to be. Nothing is a done deal. So contingency, I think, is an important thing to think about, thinking about the present and thinking about the past. And particularly now when I think whether we're feeling optimistic or pessimistic, we're running down different paths of assumption. I think those kinds of assumptions are irresponsible and even dangerous. I think we have to remember the fact that there can be change that we favor and we have to work for that. That's the moment that we're in. That's where we are. You know, we're sort of like Hamilton. Well, that just happened and that just happened. I don't know what's going to happen next. Now, he thinks it's all going to fall apart. So what does he do? <laughs> One of the things he does is he goes out and writes the Federalist essays, right? It's really important that this passes. So now I will do something to really help push people to ratify the Constitution. That's where I want us to be. I want us to be thinking about the contingency of this moment and thinking about what we can do to help put things where we want them to be. Okay, um, I'm gonna pause, pause there. That, that's the logic behind the document I picked uh, this morning. Um, as I said at the outset, there'll be many different documents and they will not, not only will they not all be Hamilton documents, but um, I don't know when the next Hamilton document will be. The next couple are all over the place. Um, but at any rate, that's the message for this morning. And now what I really wanna do is open things up um, I don't know if people have questions that they want to give, but here's where Matt is going to reappear because he will be the master of ceremonies who is seeing questions and sending them along. I've been, I've been telling Joanne since we've been planning this that I'm her proverbial James Lipton, so I'm, I'm hoping that we pull this off. So I see a few <laughs> questions in, but again, have, ask your questions. Um, and anybody... He can absolutely I'm going to try to um, encapsulate these a little bit. So if I don't get to yours, my apologies. Um, I'm going to also going to turn off my video so that I stay a little more stable. Um, <laughs> that mat is very unstable. <laughs> I know. It's like we were totally fine until we did this live. So, um, okay. So let's see. What are the things we want? We, I'm sorry, what are the things we, as normal non Hamilton citizens, to push things where we want? Calling representatives is good. This is Andrew, by the way. Um, calling representatives is good. And for all I know, that may be the best thing for us to do. But if there's more, I'd love to know. Thanks. Okay. So that's a good question. You know, what is it that we can be doing? Now, I'll start that out by saying, I'm a person who lives in the past, right? So I'm not going to beam on here and have great ideas that other people aren't having about the current moment. I actually am trying to put us in a good place to start asking questions. However, you know, I do think calling your representatives, making your feelings known in one way or another is good. I think organizing so that you are in groups of people who can make your feelings known, that's a good thing, right? That's a, that's a sort of fundamental, um, powerful push when you look back over American history in the long view. Organizing, ground up change is an important kind of change. Um, so those are certainly two things that I would suggest, and it's not just me, that's, others are suggesting that as well. I think that's the right question to ask, and I think that's a question that we should be asking of others, people who in the past have 
been in this kind of moment and have acted and have organized or, or petitioned or whatever it is that they have done, it's important to ask them as well. Obviously, um, things like, you know, how we deal with the press, what we do and what we read with the press. We're going to talk about that in a future week. We're going to talk about newspapers from the past and a little bit about newspapers in the present. Um, but I think there are people who are um, in the moment, communicators in the moment, who will have a better array of answers to that than I necessarily will have. Um, so a couple of really great questions here that I have not seen. You've probably seen them, but I have not seen these asked before. So um, could you talk a little bit about how widely the letters like Hamilton's were read? Were they discussed in print newspapers? Were they passed around um, pubs? Like how, how were these things disseminated? And I think that's a really helpful way to think about, and I know this letter was, this letter was, we think private, is that correct? But, um, but like, how, how widely were these disseminated? So I'm going to answer that in two ways, because I'm not quite sure if you're referring to the Federalist essays or just Hamilton's letters generally. So first, let me talk about um, the, in a sense, the quicker and easier answer, which is the, the Federalist essays, um, which were definitely published in newspapers, which were read aloud at taverns. Um, so those are things that are being written to be publicly disseminated. That's the point, is to try and weigh in and shape how people are debating over the Constitution. The broader question, which is about Hamilton's letters and other things, that's a really interesting question about this period. Now, I will say that um, over the years, the, the editors, the documentary editors of the Hamilton papers and documentary editors of all of the papers of these, actually anyone who's left behind a substantial amount of papers and wants to be responsible for sending them out into the public, they're amazing people because they track down everything written to or from the person whose papers they're dealing with looks up all of the references in those documents and puts them in the footnote, footnotes and then provides that. Right now, a lot of those things are coming online or in the past were printed volumes. So the, the editors of the Hamilton papers did that. There's 27 volumes of Hamilton's papers. He died kind of young, otherwise there would have been a lot more. Um, and so it, that contains reports and letters and memos and all kinds of things. Now, as far as who would have seen them, that's a big issue at the time. The mails weren't safe. Um, people weren't necessarily sure when they sent out a letter if someone else might see it. They didn't necessarily want them to. There's a reason why particularly people with political power who are saying something significant in a letter would often use codes, ciphers for the important stuff. You know, so you'll be reading a letter and you'll, it'll be fine and then suddenly there's like three lines of numbers. It's like, you know, they're using some code, I have to go find the code. Um, or uh, to protect letters so people didn't see it, they would very carefully um, not drop what they've written into the mail, but instead uh, give it to someone to deliver to the person they wanted to get it to. And you'll see, if you look at letters, and, and the document that I think they've posted here is from a database, Founders Online, that has, you know, the founders, papers, you'll see in there, if you play around with the letters, a lot of them start with something like, um, I have yours from last Tuesday, I am sending this by Mr. Smith. What that person is saying is, your letter actually got to me, you can stop worrying about it, and here's how I'm sending this to you, so, you know, watch for the letter, right? Think about the letters, where they're coming to, where they're going from, and where they've been. So that's a long answer, I realize, but um, the question of who sees what and how they see it and what they do with it is a really big element in the politics of this time period. That's really that's really helpful to think think about. Um, I'm going to switch switch gears here, and I'm kind of I'm going to jump back and forth through these questions. Um, uh, Timothy Johnson wants to know what is on your coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> Love you guys. Um, and I very deliberately decided that I, I have a lot of coffee mugs. Uh, this one says U.S. Capitol. Um, and I bought it actually at the U.S. Capitol um, when I was writing my most recent book on violence in Congress. And of course, I had to go be in the spaces and then 
I needed to bring something back that I could sit in front of me that would say U.S. Capitol as I wrote. And, and that is what that mug says. <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> I thought you might appreciate a question that was non-Hamilton related there for a second. That's an easy one. That's an easy one. <laughs> um, Carolyn asks a really in interesting question. You tweeted that you never teach the Articles of Confederation Ooh. the same way again. What will change? Can you oh. talk about the role of federal federalism now? Twitter appears, right? Twitter appears. And, and very quickly, I just want to say, you know, I'm doing this because I think it's an amazing way to teach at a moment when we need to be thinking about some of the things I'm teaching. Um, Twitter, as wacky as it is, as crazy as it is, as full of angst and everything else that it is, it can be a great teaching tool. And, and that's what pulled me in the first place on, uh, is that it was a place where I could say things like this thing you're asking about and throw it out there or explain why I think X or Y aspect of the constitution is important or whatever. Um, it's really, really a useful teaching tool. In this case, what I was suggesting was, so, you know, when, generally speaking, when I teach the Articles of Confederation, I say, you know, well, we all assume, or many people assume, what a dumb idea for a government, right? How could they possibly think that'll work? I think that's floats around out there. You know, it's, it's not centralized. The Confederation Congress, the sort of national government at the center, doesn't really have a lot of power to do very much. The Articles of Confederation were a deeply flawed thing. Those guys were not very bright for trying that. And thank goodness the Constitution came along. Now, one of the things I teach is, no, no, actually, the Articles of Confederation, <laughs> and here's live. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let that ring. That's someone telling me something's happening. Somebody, yeah. somebody really wants their question <laughs> answered. Basically. Really lost, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. Um, wow, I didn't expect that to happen. Um, part of what I'm saying now is uh, the, that we're living in this moment when we're watching people step, in a sense, step away from the national government and say, the states need to have more power. The state should be exercising more power. So we're in this moment where, in a way, we're living through people trying to figure out where power goes. And so, in a sense, we're living through a moment in which it's harder to dismiss the articles as a dumb idea, right? It's, it's a, a living moment in really thinking about options and and what were the strengths of the articles in addition to the weaknesses i just in so many ways in this moment watching the the balance of federalism and national government and state governments that's always been a key part of american politics because it was a fuzzy kind of middle ground that enabled our government to kind of shift over time right it was in a useful, ambiguous part of our government. Well, now we're seeing a lot of shifting and moving and pushing, and to a degree that, as a political historian, I can step back and say, "Wow, like I, I didn't ever think about, in a in a gut level kind of a way, what it really means to think about." where the absolute core of power is and who's responsible for things and what it feels like to be wanting to give someone power. So it, that actually connects back to what I was talking about before. Um, there is something in the contingency of this moment that I think will get me to teach the articles and thus the constitution in a different kind of a way. Well, it's fantastic. Um, somebody was asking, where did it go? I lost the question. Yes, here it is. Nathan McAllister um, asks, is uh, documenting this particular movement has been discussed nationally? Is there such a movement among historians to cast the nets and collect the documents of this moment? Um, so you're aware of. Of, of the current moment? Yes. So, so, so um, some way of cataloging, cataloging the historical artifacts that are emerging in this particular moment? Is, are you aware of historians sort of leading that front? Well, I, I actually, I mean, I can't say that that's something that I've looked for, but I, I stumbled across the fact that the New York Historical Society is actually asking people to send them um, artifacts and documentary evidence and things that, that are capturing things about this moment. So, and I'm sure that they're not alone, um, that, 
you know, people are thinking about in one way or another capturing the unfolding of the moment by capturing documents and, and evidence about it. I'll also say, and I've said this, <laughs> Twitter, Twitter followers out there, you know this, I've said it a number of times on Twitter, I think this is a really useful time to write down your thoughts about things as they unfold, right? Because this is a really weird time in so many ways. And 20 years from now, 10 years from now, it, unbelievable as this sounds, it will be hard to capture the weirdness of this moment and the distinctive things about it that make it what it is. And I think if you just, you know, commit to paper some of what you're experiencing on a personal level, speaking as a historian, boy, would that be an amazing piece of evidence for future historians, but it'll also be something that's useful for you. You know, I did that um, a few days after 9-11 and I then went and, and looked back and I said a lot of things that I wouldn't have remembered thinking that ultimately got me to write an essay. So I just think that's a useful exercise. Um, I, I'm, I always say I'm going to keep a diary and then like every other person, I write three entries and then I'm done. Um, so I know that that's probably what most people would do, but I throw that out there because that's another way of documenting any moment and, and this moment. Well, this is great. We are at 10.32, so we're actually two minutes over what we planned. Um, is it okay if we ask one more question before we end, and then, um, and then I'll have a message for, um, for everybody, and then we'll wrap it up today. I think so there have been a couple different questions on here about your favorite books and things that you might recommend to folks. Um, and uh, Stacy Ferguson mentions that uh, anything that you could share with a budding mini history nerd eight-year-old. Um, and I, I have a budding mini history nerd eight-year-old at home as well. So this, uh, this question resonates with me. So what are some of your favorite books, um, things to read that might be um, helpful or thoughtful for folks to grapple onto until we see you again next week? <laughs> so for, particularly for a budding historian. If, if, you, if you have any, that would be great. But if not, um, for adults would be that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have um, something for an eight-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I always tell people, but not necessarily eight-year-olds, although actually some younger people have done this, and what I would say to um, uh, adults is one of the wonderful ways to dip your feet in is to look in the actual artifacts, right? To look in the actual um, letters to go onto a database like Founders Online, and I know this sounds like the most boring thing imaginable, but if you plunge in there and poke around and search on things like duel or um, anarchy or whatever, and just read or pick a moment in time, like the election of 1800 and see what people are saying, you, you get a sense for the culture and the language and the feel of it that I find informative, but also, again, I, I'm going to talk a lot over the next weeks about gut level knowledge, because I'm particularly always interested in trying to figure out how people are viewing their world and how that's affecting their choices in a time period. That might be a good way to start. Um, and, you know, I think, I, I, I don't know if at this particular moment I can toss out, you know, all people must read this. Um, but that's something that's really easy to do and, it, and it's all online. And I, I just saw on the bottom of the screen, um, someone say, what is Joanne's handle on Twitter? Um, it is uh, JB as in boy F1755, uh, which used to be one of the years people thought Hamilton was born. <laughs> Excellent. I, I wondered what it was. That's fantastic. I love it. Well, thank you so much today. Um, so quick note to all of you who asked questions. There was like 28 questions and I think we asked maybe five because we're limited on time. But um, um, folks, it's what well, we're going to try to figure out a way to answer some of these maybe. Um, Joanne and I will put our heads together and maybe we tweet out some answers uh, either from NCAG or from Joanne or both. Um, we could also try to continue some of this conversation online at our Facebook page. So um watch watch some space watch all spaces I mean, watch all spaces we're trying to be we're trying to figure uh, this out uh, as diligent as possible in making sure yeah 
and and I want to thank everyone out there for showing. Excellent. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> episode number one. Uh, we are love... figuring this out. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, and and just uh, hopefully this was uh, really useful for everybody. I, I, Joanne, you did fantastic job, and it's always great to listen to you talk. Your passion about history is second to none. So. Um, so thank you for your time today and we'll look forward to next week. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. So hey, thank uh, you everybody. And, oh, go ahead. Stay safe. Matt and I will see you next Thursday, 10 o'clock AM. New document. It'll be fun. I promise. Absolutely. Thank you everybody. And we will see you next week. Bye. <laughs>